faith and fear are inversely related, right? To the extent that we have faith, we don't have fear. To the extent that we have fear, we lack faith, right? And so let's take a look at what exactly he is rebuking his disciples for. Like, what is the fear that is going on? Because it's, it's not, first of all, the emotion. It's primarily what they believe about what they're feeling. It's not the emotion. It's what they believe about what they're experiencing. And so to challenge the belief that's behind the fear, that's what Jesus is getting at. And he's calling them to faith. So first of all, these disciples, they're getting into this boat, and at least four of them are professional fishermen. And they're used to, like, going out on this particular sea, in this boat, right? And then out of nowhere, this violent squall comes, and the Sea of Galilee is prone to these kind of storms. So they probably were kind of used to them. But this storm was not only sort of rocking the boat, but the waves started breaking into the boat itself, threatening to sink it. And in the midst of this violent squall and this threat of drowning, Jesus is sleeping in the stern. (laughs) Jesus is sleeping in the stern. And his disciples approach him, and they wake him up, but pay attention to what they say to him. They say, teacher, do you not care? Do you not care that we are perishing? There's nothing wrong with them going to wake up Jesus and ask for his help. But listen to the subtle accusation in here. Do you not care? that we are perishing. And isn't that a temptation when we're going through storms in our lives to want to accuse God? Do you not care? So the first place where they lack faith is they lack faith in God's goodness. They lack faith in Jesus' goodness. But then they go on after Jesus has quieted the storm They say, who then is this whom even wind and sea obey? They're clearly surprised. Which means they didn't expect Jesus to wake up and just by a word of command, stop the storm and calm the waves. They were probably just expecting him to wake up and start, you know, uh, bucketing the water out of the boat. They didn't believe, but rather doubted his power. And they asked the right question, who then is this whom even wind and sea obey? But isn't it true that when we find ourselves in the midst of storms in our lives, that we we expect very little of God, if anything at all, like we don't, we don't believe in his omnipotence, that he actually has power over the storms in our lives. And so what we see in the disciples, I think, is good for us to reflect on where do we doubt his goodness and his power? Because that, that's what, what, what we're called to in faith. It's, faith isn't just simply believing that God exists. It's believing in his goodness and his power. These disciples obviously believe that God existed. But they didn't trust his goodness and his power. And so what do we do when we, we find ourselves giving in to fear? It's good to even, when you're removed from those moments, reflect on those moments in your life where you have encountered storms. What is it that you believe about those moments? Do you believe in God's goodness and in his power? Or did you doubt them? And that's not meant to 
bring you down, but it's meant to give you hope for the future so that when storms come again, you can be ready to, to trust the Lord with them. You can trust in his goodness and in his power to save. And I think one of the best ways to do this is by looking to the example of Mary herself. You think about Mary, this was a woman whose heart was so full of adoration and worship of our God because of his goodness and power. Now you think of her Magnificat, how she talked about, how she praised God for how the Lord vindicated the righteous, even against all odds, how with his mighty arm cast down the mighty from their thrones, but lifted up the lowly. She began that Magnificat saying, my soul magnifies the storms or the Lord. Isn't that the temptation when we encounter storms? Like we're, we're so ready to magnify those storms and the problems we go through. Mary does the exact opposite. She magnifies the Lord and his goodness and his power. The truth is, whatever we think of God, whatever your idea of God is, it's too small. You can never magnify God enough. But when we face those storms, it's easy to only see the clouds and the waves and the winds. We've got to see what the, what the eye doesn't see. That there is a transcendent God who storms don't happen without his either actively causing them or allowing them to happen. Nothing happens outside of his will. But this holy transcendent God is also gotten with us in the boat as one of us. And the one who is in the boat with us, he got into it because he's so good. And he showed us that not only is he the God who raises up the storms, but he's the God who's there to save us when we're in need of it. There is a humble Lord who is with us in the boat, who has all power in heaven and earth, who at his command stills the storms and the waves And so my friends, let's take Mary as an, our example that rather than magnifying the storms, let us magnify the Lord. Rather than telling God how big our storms are, let's tell our storms how big our God is. Nothing compares. Take to heart the same heart of Mary, that heart of adoration, that heart of worship, to ascribe to God all power, love, and goodness. He is with us, and he is more powerful than our storms.